ask you, if you would, to take out your Bible as well as take out your sermon outline. If you're new to us this morning, we use a sermon outline here because we believe that you need to be able to take this message home. If you don't have one, these men are here and they're glad to give one to you. Just lift your hand and everyone notice this. Yes, I have done something a little bit different this morning and you'll see why as we get going here. Your your outline is in landscape mode. It's wide. There's two passages I want us to see side by side. We will expositorily look at them very briefly here at the front end, and then I want to share with you something that I believe could be truly a life-changing or a reinvigorating um, powerful impact to your faith as a Christian this morning. Have you ever noticed that Hollywood loves to do stories about people's identity and perhaps they're they're losing their identity, perhaps amnesia? How many stories have you seen, whether they be love stories or spy stories or whatever, where the lead character has done what? He's, he's, He's forgotten who he was. And as the story goes, he's living out these these events, and he's trying to remember. He's trying to remember. And, I mean, let's name a few of these that have done that. Okay, I mean, what is one of the popular ones that does that? Somebody said it. While you were sleeping, right? The Sandra Bullock movie, the guy, you know, rescues somebody off a train track or something like that, and he hits his head, and he wakes up engaged to Lucy, and uh, he's trying to figure out whether he loves her, and of course the other brother makes a move on it, and it's a great story, um, but it's all about amnesia. And then we also see other stories, I mean, whether it be the Jason Bourne series, he's trying to figure out who he is, you know, this, this, these cases of lost identity. There's also stories that very often come along that have to do with mistaken identity, that someone is accused of a crime, or somebody um, goes through something, and every, the whole story is, is built upon the, uh, on the premise that they've, that they've messed up in identifying someone um, in, these, in, in this, and they, they build a story off of that. I believe that Christians very often have some type of mistaken identity about who they think that they really are and who they understand themselves to be, or sometimes they have amnesia. They don't realize who they are. Occasionally, you'll hear a story of someone who did not realize who they were in their family lineage, family lineage. and in fact, it comes to be um, known that, in fact, they have been made a great inheritance, and they had no idea that this is who they were and this is what they had that was there. I believe that very often Christians can come into any one of these categories that they either never knew or they forgot or they have mistaken their identity for something else. I want to say to you that when we begin to understand what the Bible says about who we are as God's people, when we begin to look and to see what God has done and what he has said as he makes us his children, that this can be an incredibly powerful truth that will change your life. I can tell you that that is exactly what happened with me. Yes, I went to Florida State University um, for my university years, and uh, they lost yesterday, and that was really sad, but, that's the, but it kind of reminds me even of, of this illustration that I, that I have felt led to share with you this week. I remember that as a freshman in college, I was making some new friends and getting to know folks, and I had already turned my life over to the Lord and was really seeking to walk with Him there in Tallahassee. And I remember the ups and the downs of my Christian life were pretty great that there were some highs and there were some lows as I went. And I remember that that was somewhat exhausting at times. And I often felt very inadequate and I often felt incapable of living the Christian life. Um, At one point, I called up um, my, my mom and my dad and I said, I can't do this. And mom and dad said, well, we've known that about you for a long time. And that was very encouraging to hear your mom and dad say, we've known you can't live the Christian life for a long time. But then they followed up with, we've just been waiting for you to figure it out. You have to let the Lord do it through you, Andrew. 
You're incapable of doing this in your own strength. This is why God has given you His Holy Spirit. This is why He, if you will read what the Bible says about what all He's done and what all He is going to do as He works in your life, that it is Him who will do this. And around that time, I had a good friend with a guy named Jeff Wyrick. He was from Panama City. And Jeff was my same age, and one night we were up late talking. He was part of the college ministry at First Baptist Church of Tallahassee. And in a kind of a moment of vulnerability, I just shared with him, um, Jeff, I, I asked him a question. I said, Jeff, do you ever have um, an identity crisis? Do you ever try to figure out who you are? Do you ever feel like you're, you're just, you're not sure of who you are, and you, you have what we would call a bona fide identity crisis? And I'll never forget Jeff saying to me in his southern drawl that night, he just said, oh, I stopped having them. I just decided I'm not doing this anymore. I said, really? And he said, yeah. I just started to realize who Jesus says that I really am is all that really matters. And all of my feelings and all of what the world and all of what the people and all about my failures and everything else, what all that says comes a distant second to what Jesus has said in his word about who he has made me to be. And so here I am sharing this with you over 20 years later, 25 years later, um, that, that God wants us to know who he has designed us to be. And there are many, many Christians that struggle a great deal in their desire to obey God, in their desire to, to make it in the Christian life. They, they're not making it. There's, there's failure after failure, and there's frustration because they want to, they desire to, but they, they just keep getting distracted. And this morning, I want us to see how to get our eye on the proper view of what God has made us to be. So the title of the message is The True Identity of True Christians, and we have two passages, Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 4, and Galatians 2.20. Let's start on the right side of your page, Colossians chapter 3. The first one you see here is Colossians chapter 3, 1 through 4. Look at verse 1. If then, can you circle those two words, if then, if then you have been raised with Christ... Seek the things that are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on, on things that are above, not on the things that are on the earth. Verse 3, for you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Verses 1 through 4 have this powerful statement about who we are and what we're supposed to do. Look at Galatians 2.20. This is one of the most quoted passages that I share on a regular basis. Hardly a Sunday goes by or certainly a month goes by that this does not wind up in a sermon, and the reason is it is one of the most important perspectives that a Christian could ever understand. Galatians 2.20 says, I have been, in fact, let's read it out loud together. Can we read this? Everybody clear your throat. <clears throat> Here we go. Don't mumble. We'll have to do it twice. Do it strong. Galatians 2.20, this is beautiful. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. You see, these two sections, and there's many passages in the Scripture that are similar to these, but these two passages really describe who a Christian really is if he's truly a Christian. Now, the very first one, I want you to see this in Colossians 1, 3 through 4, and notice the 1, 2, 3, 4 below Colossians 1, 3 through 4. I want you to notice some things. First of all, notice the condition. There is a condition on Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 4, and it begins with the words, if then, or if, if you have been raised with Christ. The question here is, are you truly a Christian? Are you truly in Christ? 
Have you truly died to yourself and been a lot made alive in Christ? Now, this is what it means to become a Christian. When we become a Christian, if we are truly converted to Christ, if we are truly brought into saving belief and faith in Jesus Christ, the picture is this, is that we realize that the life of sin in this earthly mortal form is a life that is going nowhere with God, and we die to our sin. Part of this is the picture of turning to God in repentance from our sin, we repent and turn to Christ in belief. And so if th- this is how we die to ourselves and we become alive to Christ, placing our faith in Jesus and no longer in ourselves. So the question is, you cannot have the identity with Christ if in fact you have not been raised with him. And notice this, this isn't being written to people that are in the next life. This is being written to people that are in this life. He is making the point that if you have come to Christ and you have been raised with him by faith, he is saying a command. This is number two. So the condition is, are you really a Christian in verse one? Number two, we also see in verse one, notice the command, fill that in. Seek the things that are above. Can you underline the word seek? He's saying if you've been raised in Christ, then seek the things that are above. That's the things that are of heaven, the things that are of God. And look what it says here, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. And then we see another part of the command at verse 2. He says, set your minds on things that are above not on things that are on the earth. So there's this command, and the command is stop being obsessed with the things of this earthly life. Start being obsessed with the things of God. Start to see the truth of what God has called you to, and stop obsessing with all of the things that are passing away in this earth. All of this stuff is going to be gone, and God calls us to look and to set our minds and set our, our sights on the things that are, that are eternal, that are forever. Look at number three. So notice the condition, notice the command, also notice the circumstances, and this is the reason why, and we see it in verse three. Look at verse three. Why should you do this? For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ and God. Now that, at, you know, somebody from the world that doesn't understand the spiritual nature and the broader picture of what the Bible is really talking about, about spiritual things, they would say, you guys make no sense. You guys make no sense. Look at number three, four, or verse three. You have died and your life is hidden. What do you mean? You're dead. How can you, you don't have any life if you've died. Oh, no, 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 no. We see throughout the Scripture that we see that there is a, there's this earthly life that is passing away, but there is something far grander that is the spiritual life of being alive in God, being alive in Him. This is why Jesus would look at a, at a, at a Pharisee, uh, a religious leader in his day named Nicodemus, and he would look at Nicodemus and he'd say, Nicodemus, unless you're born again, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. And so the first life passes away, but the second life that God has called us to, which happens during this life for the person of faith, is that the spiritual transformation happens long before your body ever quits and long before you die. Notice what it says here in verse 3, for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. So what the picture is, is that you are dead to your old nature, but by faith, by faith, You have been made alive in your new nature of forgiveness with Christ. And so notice that it is a different circumstance. It is a changed circumstance, and that circumstance is what gives us a new identity. You are to live in Christ. Look at number four. Notice the certainty. Notice the certainty. And we see this in verse four. I love it. When Christ, who, underline it, who is your life. You see, for the Christian, Christ now becomes everything. This is your very life. Um, When we want to talk about 
time, how important something is in our present culture, very often you will hear this phrase. You'll hear the phrase, hey, man, this is a matter of what? Life and death. This is really serious, you know. Um, th- when, when we talk about life and death, now, now you know, very often we uh, apply that type of standard to things that really aren't life and death. But occasionally in your life, you come across things that are really serious, and, and somebody could die, or you could die, or somebody else is, is, is on, the, on the verge of this because it is so serious. And so when we say that, I want us to see that here it is saying that, that this is more even than your physical life because your life now is in Christ. Look at verse 4 again. It says, when Christ, who is your life, appears, and then here's the other part of the certainty, then you also will appear with him in glory. It doesn't say that you might appear with him in glory or you're put in the running to appear with him in glory. No, this is part of the certainty of the gospel, that Jesus is your life, and because Jesus is your life, you're going to be with him and you're going to appear with him in glory. And whether this is talking about the fact that when he comes back to reign, that we come back to reign with him, this is part of the prophecy of all of God's word, but, or, or whether it's the sheer fact of the matter that we're going to be with him and we're going to be like him, this is the glorious picture of the certainty of true identity with Christ. So we've seen the condition of this, if you're a Christian, the command, set your mind on things above. Twice it says it, set your mind on things above, not on things that are going away. Number three, the circumstance. Why should you do this? Because you've died and your life is now in Christ. Number four, you can be certain about this, and one day you're going to be so rejoicing with the fact that you are with God and you're going to appear with him. Well, Galatians 2.20 is the other passage. We read this out loud together. Notice this. There's a few things I want you to see here about our identity. Notice the passage, Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live but Christ who lives in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Now, there's some people in our modern age, and part of our worldly thinking would be, what about me? I mean, this is saying that it's all Christ. What about me? I I mean, isn't the person and the individual really important? What about self-esteem and self-love and about my independence and my will and my thought? My friends, if you have too much of that attitude, it will take you to hell. You see, the attitude of all of the gospel, of all of God's plan, is that our lives are not just for us. Our lives are actually for a bigger purpose than us. The bigger purpose is not that we would live for our glory, but the bigger purpose is that we would live for God's glory. You see, that is a a much greater reason to live. That is a much grander thing, especially when you consider this, that we being sinners deserve to be cut off from God. We deserve to be condemned by God. We deserve to be cast out by God. But God, in his grace and showing his mercy, he's calling people to himself. And when they respond in faith and in grace, when they respond in faith and repentance to his grace, here's what happens. We start to see the grand reason for which we were created, to give him glory. And so here we see that it's, it's really a, a bigger picture than just ourselves. If you want to be the center of your universe, you can't have God. You see, our present world seeks to make the individual the center of their universe. And as long as that is the mentality of the spirit of this age, the spirit of this present darkness, you are cut off from God. But when you begin to see that you were created for a grander purpose, and listen to this, by God's grace, he gives you a reason to live that is far beyond yourself. And listen to this, even a reason to die a physical death because there is a life that is much grander and much greater awaiting for those who trust his promises. This is the gospel, the fact that Jesus would come and die in our place for us. So 
Notice in Galatians 2.20, just kind of look at that verse again at the top. I've been crucified with Christ, no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. That is, memorize it. Memorize it, memorize it, memorize it, because this can help you live the Christian life. Number one, notice the centrality of Christ. Notice the tremendous centrality of Christ. It's all about Jesus. It's not about you and me. He, I'm out, he's in. I mean, that's the picture. Look at number two. Notice the control of Christ. Um, you know what? Back up. I want you to see on the screen. Um, go back to those two. The first one is, the, here's the picture. All the action and all the focus is on who? That's Galatians 2.20. It's all about him. And then look at the next part there. It's all about him, not me. That's the picture. The identity begins to shift from me, 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 the me monster that makes you such a joy to be with, by the way. Um, the me monster turns into a beautiful glorification of Christ. And that's the picture. This is how we begin to live in victory. I know that, that we all struggle in honoring our, in our lives honoring to Christ. We struggle to rein in the things that we shouldn't do and the things that we should do. And here we begin to see that it's not in us. It's all in him. And so that's number two, is notice the control of Christ. It's no longer me, but it's all him. Number three, notice again we see this idea of confidence. Notice the confidence in Christ. And I want you to see where we see that in this verse um, in the mid part of the verse, go on to the next slide there, TJ. In the mid part of the verse, it says, I live by faith in my own efforts. Is that what it says? But I live by faith in the Son of God. And the way that the Holy Spirit inspired Paul to write this, he uses the term Son of God. He's reminding us that Jesus wasn't just a prophet. He wasn't just a priest. He wasn't just Miracle Max. I mean, he was the Son of God. He was indeed the God who came to set us free. He was indeed, when you're putting your faith in Jesus, you're putting your faith in God. And so that's part of this picture that you can have confidence that he has indeed done a work that is going to see you through. And then notice the, the last part here is notice the commitment. Notice the commitment of Christ. Here we see Christ's great commitment to us. And we see it at the end of verse four. Look at the screen if you haven't already. This is underlined. Who loved me, and what did he do? and gave himself for me. He loved me, and he gave himself for me. You see, you're wondering, how valuable are you to God? Your identity? It's, it's so much more beyond what you could ever do him, for him. It is all about what Christ did for you when he showed you how much he loved you, when he died on the cross in your very place. This is the gospel. You see, love, you may want to make a note there off to the side, love is a commitment. And like any love commitment, it involves a denial of self. Jesus denied himself. He said, Father, not my will, but your will, just hours before he went to the cross. And so, this is the picture of true love. True love denies itself and true love sacrifices for the other. And here is what we see Jesus doing perfectly, ultimately. This is the, this is the ultimate example of what true love is all about. He loved me and he gave himself for me. Now, if Christians will begin to see what all Christ did when he died on the cross, and when he calls us to himself and gives us faith to believe, and then he transfers us from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his beloved son, and he says, I have washed you with my blood, I have made you clean, you are mine, in fact, you're a trophy of my grace. If anybody wants to know if I'm a gracious God, they can just look at you. They can just look at Jose Torres, and so here's Jose Torres, and it's not Jose that we're celebrating, it's Christ in Jose that we're celebrating. This is the picture of a new identity that Christians 
must embrace. So fill this in, the first blue line that is there. True Christians, so we're, we're talking about true Christians, not cultural Christians that kind of just gone to church and all of that kind of thing and, and never, really, never really come to Christ. We're talking about true Christians who have come to repentance and faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, they've been transformed. True Christians must not buy the lie. Fill that in, buy the lie. True Christians must not buy the lie of either stolen, mistaken, or forgotten identity. And yet I believe that many, many Christians struggle in their walk with God and struggle in their purity, struggle in their, in their obedience to the Lord because they just either don't know what all Christ has done for them or they have forgotten or the devil has come along or the world has come along and lied to them. See, notice this statement that is underneath that. No amount of worldly success, good looks, pedigree, intelligence, toughness, material possessions, status, or even mess-ups or failures determine three things that are so important to your identity. Determine your acceptance, your security, or your significance. None of these earthly things ultimately determine your acceptance, your security, or your significance if you are in Christ. You see, if you're, if you're not in Christ and you're just in the world and you just really care about what the world thinks, then all of these things really matter. Your worldly success, you know, your background, how you look. The world puts a lot of value on how, how you look or, or these abilities that you might have or um, maybe what you own or something like that. It, you know, th there's one of these or a few of these that the world just really leans on and people in the world are leaning on them and leaning on them and they're finding their identity in those things. And what we begin to see that the Bible says is all that stuff is going away. I mean, it, it, maybe you're the prettiest gal in your high school class, or you're the prettiest gal at your workplace or whatever, or a guy or whatever, and you know, if, if we are putting all of our value in what others think and all that, we, we are, do not at all understand the grand picture of the gospel of true acceptance, true security, and true significance in Christ. Because we all know, I mean, I, I remember four years later after talking with Jeff about that, about my identity thing, and, and starting to walk with the Lord, I, I just was really involved with Campus Crusade, really involved with a few other things at, at Florida State, and really began to grow. And I just got to where I shared my faith a lot, would share with people. And I remember my last semester, about to graduate from Florida State, had a big accounting exam. I was a business major, so I had an accounting exam. Um, before that last one, and uh, was studying a lot with a couple of guys, and I was studying with the president of the Pikes, or the Pi Kappa Alpha fraternity, and we sat in my car the night before the exam, and he just, he just said to me, he said, you know, Andrew, I, I, don't, I don't get it. He said, you're not involved with a fraternity. Um, you're not a big sports guy. Um, you're kind of puny, and, and you're not very good looking and everything, but you, you got all these friends and you have this peace, and he said, I'm the president of the Pikes. Here, I have been involved with sports all the way through. I've had some of the prettiest girlfriends that you could have at Florida State University. And he said, I am miserable. And this great big guy, 6'4", sat in my little 1982 Toyota Starlet, and he wept like a baby that night. As he said, I'm about to graduate, and this, I'll never forget, he said, I have no friends. None. And you know, I, by God's grace, I shared with the gospel with him, and over the course of some time, he prayed to receive Christ. He wound up coming to Christ. But I want you to see that you can have all of that stuff, and ultimately, he didn't feel accepted, really. He didn't have security in that, and he had put significance in all the wrong things, and he was miserable. Friends, that's what happens when we rely on stuff that is passing away. But when we rely on the eternal truth of who God is and what he's doing in his plan in the universe and his plan beyond the universe and his promises that he has made, then we begin to see a life where there's true acceptance, there's true security, and there's true significance. And he has made us to enjoy those things. So look at the next blue statement that's here. True Christians must believe the truth. 
True Christians must believe the truth of their identity in Christ. Now, out to the side, you may want to put on there, in order to believe something, you have to know it. I haven't put that as part of the outline, but that, that's part of the picture. You think about it. If you don't know something, you can't believe it. And so I, I want to encourage you that part of believing this is knowing it, and which is why we preach the Bible. This is why we teach about it, why we say to you that you should read the Bible, study the Bible, enjoy the Bible, j- just take in the Bible as you, as you live your life. This is, in order to believe the truth, you have to know the truth. And so I want you to see a little bit here about these. You see, underneath each one of these, there's all of these passages that are so rich. And we're not going to read all of them, but I I want you to start to get a feel for it. The first thing that we've mentioned here is that if you will look what the Bible actually says in this first one on the left, you will start to see that I am accepted in Christ. If you are in Christ, if you have been transformed by Christ, if you are truly a Christian, notice what the Bible says about you. In John 1.12, it says that I have been made God's child. Look at John 15.15. I'm considered Christ's friend, not his enemy. Notice the next one. I have been justified before God. That means made right. I'm no longer before God in, in, in wanting. I'm no longer before God and not measuring much up. I have been justified. Look at 1 Corinthians 6, 17. I am united with God's Spirit. His Spirit is in my spirit. My spirit is in His Spirit. This is a beautiful spiritual connection and identity of who we become in Christ. 1 Corinthians 6 says, I have been bought by Christ. And when we are bought with a price, this is the beautiful picture. It's not just any price, but it's the precious price of the creator of the universe who bought us. I'm a member in his body. Ephesians 1.1 says, I'm a saint forgiven of sin. I still sin. I'm still... I'm, I'm a saint who is still a sinner. I, I mean, the, the, the picture is that I still sin, but God says my sin, past, present, and future has been covered by the blood of Christ. This is an amazing statement of God's grace. I mean, I can understand if he would say, okay, up to this point, everything's forgiven, but anything beyond here, you're on your own, and you're going to really be held accountable because I made you a Christian. That's not what he says. He says the true child of God who's come to him in faith, that our sin, not in part, but in whole, has been nailed to the cross and it has been forgiven. Look at Ephesians 2.18. I have total access to God, that I can have come before God. Hebrews says that I can come boldly to the throne of grace and find help in time of need. I've been redeemed and forgiven. Colossians 2.10 says my spiritual standing before God is complete. There's nothing else I can do to add to it. My spiritual standing before God is complete. Um, This is an amazing statement of acceptance. And you know, there's about 150 other places that we could look to see God's acceptance of his children. Look at the next one there. I'm secure in Christ. Christians need to realize that if Christ has saved them, they are truly secure. They're secure in a way that this world could never threaten Notice this in Romans 8, 1 and 2, the most important thing, I am forever free from condemnation. In Romans 8, it says, for we have been justified by faith, and we are, we are now under no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus because we have been justified by faith. Romans 8, 28, I'm assured of this, that all things work together, the good, the bad, and the ugly all work together for those who are in Christ. There's no greater place of security you could find. Look at Romans 8, 31 and 32. I'm free from all charges against me. I'm not wondering if something's going to come up. Some of you have had legal trouble. Some of you have had either criminal legal trouble or you've had civil legal trouble, and things are out there, and you've been really nervous. Is this going to come back and get me? You know, could something happen where I'm going to get sued, or could something happen where I'm going to be charged? (laughs) It seems like half of Washington is in that condition right now, right? I mean, this is kind of how they live. Oh, it's going to happen. Listen to this. And and I recently was listening to Chuck Colson's testimony again, and I want to encourage you, go to YouTube, listen to anything by Chuck Colson. You will be blessed. Um, He was a, a, a really wicked, terrible man 
that wound up going to prison for his crimes in Watergate and wound up becoming a Christian. Um, just a, a beautiful statement that is involved with that. But notice this, this. Romans 8, 31 and 32 says, there are no charges that are going to crop up against you if you're in Christ. That is an amazing security. Romans 8, 35 through 39 are those glorious verses at the end of that great chapter that say, ultimately, I cannot be separated from God's love. There's nothing I can do and there's nothing anybody else can do. There's nothing that exists in the world that can separate me from God's love. In 2 Corinthians 1, 21 through 22, I am established, recognized, sealed, and guaranteed by God in Christ. Wow. Colossians 3, 3, what we've just been reading. I am hidden in Christ. I am safe in him. I am protected in him. He covers me with himself. Even Philippians 1, 6 says, I'm confident he will finish me. He's not done with me. He's still making me into the person that he's going to be. Positionally, I'm finished, as in he has made me right before him. But in, even in his great patience and in his great grace in this earthly life, he's still making me more and more and more into conformity with Jesus Christ, his son. What a beautiful statement that he's, so, he's the patient father and that he is confident. He says, I am confident that he who began a good work in you will perfect it under the day of Christ Jesus. Philippians 3, 20 says, I've been made a citizen of heaven. 2 Timothy 1, 7, I have not been given a spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. That passage right there has saved me from insanity, I think, many times. When I thought I was losing my mind, when I was afraid, when I've struggled with things in this life, there's been many times I've gone back to 2 Timothy 1.7 that says that fear doesn't come from God. What comes from God is power and love and sanity, a sound mind. When you're in Christ, you are secure. I, I want to encourage you. Look at the next one. Not only am I accepted and secure, but I'm also significant. Now, some people would say, isn't this just kind of a, a throwback to the days of, you know, exalting our, self, um, our self-esteem and exalting our self-worth uh, and, and all of those things? Well, listen, Jesus didn't die for junk. Jesus died for something that is very significant. Jesus died. Don't turn the sheet over. I heard somebody turn it over. No, this is too, way too important. Look at this. I am significant because of all that Christ has done. This shows how valuable and and the significance that my soul longs for, it's found in Christ. And anybody in this room, anybody in this world who has come to faith in Jesus Christ can know that the eternal ruler of the universe thinks that you're so significant that he would come and he would die on the cross because he loves you. You become an an object of his love. Look at these significance verses. Matthew chapter 5, 13, 14. The Bible calls us, Jesus said that we are the salt and light of the earth. That's pretty important. We are the preservative for the earth. We are that which shows light that in a world of darkness, don't write off your Christianity as unimportant college student or mom or dad or neighbor to people that are around you in your, in your life or in your, your coworkers there. Listen, God has given you the great privilege of being the salt and the light that can show others who he is. In John 15, verse one and verse five, it says, I am a branch of the life of Christ. He is the vine, we are the branches. We're connected to him. I've been chosen to bear fruit. That's what God has saved us for in order to bear fruit in our lives. Look at Acts 1.8. I'm authorized to be a witness of Christ. Jesus said, all authority has been given on me, given to me in heaven and earth, and you shall be my witnesses. That's very significant. You see, Christians that don't realize these things that Christ has given us to do in service to him, Christians that don't pay any attention to that, they have all kinds of identity problems because they are missing out on their greatest purposes for life. You see, God has made it so that 
we can show the world who he is. And when we have no interest in that, and we're we're really just worried about ourselves, and we're just worried about our own self-fulfillment and all of those things, no wonder we're miserable. We're not living for the purpose we were created. And we're not living for the purpose in which we, by which we were saved. We are authorized to be his temple. Look at this. God thinks you're so significant that he calls you the temple of the Holy Spirit. This is where God dwells. He comes to live within his children. That's pretty significant. That's another reason to take care of your body, is that it's important to God. It's important for His glory that you would be able to use. We've been made a minister of reconciliation. Did you know that everybody in this room who is a true Christian is also a minister? You say, now they're making me a minister. I can't believe it. I didn't say it. The Lord has said it. In Timothy, I mean, excuse me, in Corinthians, we are, we are, we've been made ministers of reconciliation. That means that we meter out God's reconciliation. We, we distribute God's reconciliation. We are ministers of his reconciliation. There, there are so many passages that we could look at all the way through. I'm accepted in Christ. I'm secure in Christ. I'm significant in Christ. There's a lot of Christians that if they would study what the Bible really says about who they are in Jesus, much of their depression, much of their great frustration, much of the brokenness that is very raw to them would begin to take a different place in their life if they would realize what all the Bible says God has done when he made you his child. This is better than any blow it out vacation for your soul. This is better than any new job promotion. This is better than any new thrill or any new thing that you could ever buy to be the bomb and the healer of your heart. Knowing who you are in Christ will do far more than any of those things. Flip your sheet over safely now. The first one in the upper left in the teal color where it says 1 Corinthians 15.22. 1 Corinthians 15.22, it says, For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. For true Christians, you can say, I am in Christ. Fill that in. I am in Christ. This is a beautiful promise. In Adam, I was dead, but in Christ, the second Adam, I am alive. This is the beautiful picture of what he has made us to be. I'm no longer in myself. I'm no longer in my sin. I'm no longer in my brokenness. I am found in him. No greater place of identity. Look at Romans 8.1. We talked about this just a moment ago. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. I am justified. No longer is, is something out there lingering, and I am, I am not justified. No longer do I, do I not measure up. Now I measure up. I measure up before God, not because of me, but because of Christ and what he did on the cross for me. I am justified. He paid my sin debt. Look at the next one, John 1, 12. But to all who did receive them, who believed in his name, he gave, underline it, the right to become children of God. Fill this one in. I am adopted. Adopted. And let me tell you that adoption is beautiful. Um, Adoption is a glorious thing. Um, I, we have some family members that have adopted others, and the kids were talking one day, and they were all talking, and they were like, yeah, mom and dad had you, but they chose me. And so, you know, you know I, I don't know how to really feel about that. Um, but, I, I mean, it's a beautiful thing. Adoption is a beautiful thing. And God says what, what you were on your own, you no longer are, now you're mine. And that is a beautiful picture. I'm adopted and made alive in him. Look at Romans 8, 38 and 39. We were just talking about this. Look what it says there. I am sure that neither death, 
nor life. So it starts off with the biggest one of all <laughs> to us in this earthly thinking. He says, I'm sure that neither death nor life nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation, that's everything, will be able to separate us from the love of God, where? In Christ Jesus, our Lord. You see, if you're in Christ Jesus and he is your Lord, nothing can separate you from a good and righteous and holy God. I am secure. I am secure in him. Now look at the last two. Romans 6, chapter 5 through, or Romans 6, verses 5 through 6, it says, if we have been united with him, you see there's that conditional again, if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might not be brought to nothing. It's just going to rot away. It's just going to disintegrate away. No, the body of sin is not brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. You see, the picture is this. I am free. I'm no longer in bondage to my sin. I no longer have to live in my sin. You know, I'm not like a dog that just can't resist and goes and it does whatever it's going to do. No, the picture is this. I am a blood-bought, freed child of God. That sin does not reign over me. And look at Philippians 1.6. I love this one. I love this. I am sure of this that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Christ Jesus. I am in progress. My life is still in progress, and my faith is still in progress, and he is still patient with me and gracious to me and working with me and changing me and making me into conformity with his beloved son. God is still, this, and by the way, this pro, listen, this process of you learning to walk with God in this earthly life, this is glorifying to God. It's glorifying to God when you have faith in him, when you trust in him. Listen, when you learn what his word says and then you, and then you trust what he says, that he can overcome the struggles in your life. He can overcome the sin cycles that you can't break out of. When you begin to see what his word says and you look to him and you begin to love him more than you love your sin and there's victory that begins there and these things, you see, listen, that's glorifying to God because with faith, that pleases God. It says without, by, without faith in Hebrews, without faith it is impossible to please God. But as you grow in faith, this is very pleasing to God. He loves it. He, he looks at us and he says, look, Victor is trusting me more. Victor is learning to trust what I've said. Victor is learning to trust what I promised. And that is very, very glorifying to God. So in your struggle, in your, in your struggle to honor him, the more you come in conformity with his beloved son as you live out his word, this brings glory to God. And so, you know, don't just, I used to just be so frustrated with my sin struggles and so frustrated with this present life. I'm no, I'm no good at being a Christian. Other people seem to do it a whole lot better than me and everything else. No, you know what? God's just dealing with me and he just wants me to trust in him. And he's not comparing me to everybody else. He's comparing me to his son, so I am, I'm toast if I was without his grace. I, but because I'm compared to his son, and because his son now lives in me, I'm fully accepted, I'm fully secure, and I'm fully significant, and that is what brings glory to God. He is in the process of making me who he wants me to be. I, I hope and you see in this that you would fill this out. You cannot know your true identity in Christ if you do not know God's word. You cannot get the facts of who Christ makes his children to be by going fishing 
and seeing a beautiful sunrise even while you're fishing. That's, that's not going to, nothing wrong with going fishing. Went fishing this week. I, I, I enjoy that. I mean, we, our family loves these things and, and so forth. But, you know, seeing nature will not reveal to you all of these truths. It may help your faith. It may encourage you and so forth. But looking elsewhere and, and feeding on the things of the world will not show you what God's Word has been designed to show you by His good plan. Notice the next part. In fact, the message of the world, the world's messaging, is very powerful and very deceiving as it seeks to pull you away from God. It's very simple. The messaging of the world the present of this fallen world that is raging against God. We studied that Philippians, or, uh, Psalm 2 a few weeks ago. This present world rages against God. And, and the truth for a Christian's heart, it is seeking to, to pull you away from all that God has said. This is why we must know what he says. This is why we must know what his word says. You see, fill this in as the last as we look at this. Staying in God's Word, underline that, staying in God's Word. And secondly, standing in faith with God's people is how you not just survive, but how you thrive as a Christ follower. It's God's Word and God's truth through His people in faith in what He said, believing His Word, understanding His Word, is what brings victory to the Christian life. I want to take just a second. I want to ask you this question. Could you make a list off the top of your head of everything that Christ has made you to be? if you're a Christian. Could you make a list of that? Could you list everything that he has done? Or how many things could you list off the top of your head? There's two, two questions here. If you would say, Pastor, I, I kind of got nothing. I'm, I'm a member of Sheridan Hills Baptist Church. Does that count? I tell you, maybe, maybe. If you're a Christian, that's, that's a good start. A good but other than that, I just don't have anything. Maybe, maybe you just don't know, and that's, I want to commend you to, for being here, but I, I want to encourage you to say, I need to be in God's Word to know what He says about me. Or maybe you can make a list. You know, there's a lot of people who can make a list, but somehow, in their daily application they are still faltering and they're still running battered and bruised from one failure in one conflict to another. I want to say to you that you need to look at what His Word says and apply what you know in faith. There is a difference in knowing something and living by faith in it. And for many Christians, they need to apply what they know. They need to say, yes, this is what he has said, and I know it, and I trust it. That he indeed is the strength of my life. He is my salvation and my hope. Would you stand with me for prayer?